Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, and continuing on with my Booker project, uh, now I wanted to look at another year ending with a three uh, as I'm sort of working backwards from 2023 and looking at sort of past instalments and, uh, from, from there. Uh, and this is the shortlist from 1993. And it's quite weird looking at this a whole 30 years later um, because that feels like quite a substantial amount of time. Um, and it's interesting seeing which of these books or authors are sort of still widely thought about um, and what have you. Anyway, I'm going to be going through a bit of the shortlist. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And here we go. Let's talk a little bit about the shortlist, starting with the winner first and then going through alphabetically by the rest of the authors. So first up, we have the winner, Roddy Doyle with Paddy Clark, ha ha ha. Um, and it's, <laughs> that's one of those titles, by the way. Every time you go to say it, it's kind of difficult to do because like, do you laugh? Do you just say ha ha ha? Um, which then sounds really sarcastic. Anyway, uh, Paddy Clark, ha ha ha, uh, is um, a story about a young boy growing up in Dublin. Um, and it is quite uh, notable, I guess, in many ways for being a book that is told in through the eyes of that 10 year old it's told in the language and the style of a 10 year old um and as such at times uh it, there's a sort of magic that can sometimes appear in the book because we know there's a sort of dramatic irony almost because the character often doesn't fully understand things that are going on around him um or doesn't have the language for it where we the adult reader or presumed adult reader um can so we often can can look at it I and mean, it's interesting as well because i think that you know uh, it's sort of one of those winners that sort of maybe gets a bit overlooked, even though Roddy Doyle has been famous for a few other um, big books, uh, you know, so it's it's sort of an interesting one that this in some ways, you know, The Commitments being um, his big famous book, which also was then turned into a film that was also very big. So, um, yeah, it's, he, it's, it's a... A book that kind of follows this young boy and he what we really sort of start to see is the the ways that um some of the difficulties of the time not only fears of violence or conversations around um what it means to be irish what it means to be growing up in an area of town that's not always particularly rich what that looks like through the eyes of this young boy and it, i thought it was really interesting for that particularly if you put it against other books that are that do a similar thing and sort of telling a working class narrative from a young person's perspective something like Shuggy Bain for example another winner that in many ways has overlaps but is told um, almost with the sort of there's a, a more kind of adult writing style um, whereas this being written written in that kind of young voice I think both put me off the book at times and also really endeared the book to me so it's, I kind of felt I was in a bit of a, an odd position with this, but I, I still think it's a really interesting book nonetheless, um, even despite my slight aversion to reading um, a, you know, a book in the kind of eyes of a kid. Um, but there we go. Next up, and keeping the theme of books about really difficult political situations, because this was the 90s, uh, we have Tibor Fisher with Under the Frog. And I spoke about this book recently in a weekly roundup. Uh, but essentially, this book is uh, looking at... Uh, the the lives of various people in Hungary during um, sort of uprisings and sort of bits of revolution and civil war and, and everything kind of going on in and around the area, um, and particularly what that then meant for the local people. But it's a book that's sort of told with humour, even though it's very dark humour. It's often, you know, people trying to edge their way out of some incredible difficulties um, and sort of doing so by whatever means necessary. And often for them, that is almost complete avoidance. And so part of the absurdity of this book is the fact that something very severe and brutal is going on outside their windows, but they are thinking about table tennis or they're thinking about, you know, going to another country or whatever and daydreaming about that. And so there's a real escapism from the characters that we know is sort of futile and, and quite horrific in many ways that you know that, that, that what they're hiding from is or escaping from is is pretty grim um and so yeah it just sort of starts to build a bit of a picture of this shortlist being about some quite weighty issues as you'll see when we come to the other books in this list this is a if you're looking for a nice cheery booker shortlist 1993 is not your year um but i think that is in many ways what the the prize often does it sort of is reflective of the period that's happening and 93 that means probably many of these books would have been written sort of late 80s early 90s 
um, and or you know the, the authors would would have been starting to write them then. And this is a, a time of incredible political upheaval and change, um, particularly in Europe. Um, and so yeah, it probably it makes sense that it kind of shows up here. But there is something really interesting about the 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 humour of this book. That it's an incredibly dark book in many ways, but there is this complete absurdity and silliness um, in the in the interim. Keeping up this nice jovial tone of the books from this list, Scar Tissue by Michael Ignatieff. Um, and this is a book that uh, I thought was incredibly written and really well done, um, albeit about an incredibly difficult situation. So what we see in this book is um, a character start to deal with his parents' uh, diminishing health and particularly around dementia um, and I think this is probably one of the most um, as somebody who's going through it with family at the moment uh, this was an incredibly perceptive book um, in terms of how it deals with the the small changes that feel most tragic so the way that the book captures um, small details of how what what things start to be forgotten what 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 it looks like when you start to forget and i think the book does an incredible job of remirroring the experiences here in the language there's a sort of an uncertainty at times of the text it kind of expands and contracts in these really interesting ways of sometimes really capturing these sort of moments of clarity and perceptiveness um, and at other times feeling slightly enmeshed in something a bit more chaotic um, an incredibly uh, difficult read at times, but I think a really profound and really important one. Um, we we watch as the the characters deal sort of privately and publicly with with what's going on, um, and I also think there's something really startling about the way this is written. That is just it, it doesn't seek pity. It doesn't seek kind of a sort of big payoff of like, well, everything was bad and now it's good. It kind of, not wallows, it kind of just um, sits in that discomfort um, in, a, in a really interesting way that I thought was very, very well done. Next up is Remembering Babylon by David Malouf. Um, and this is a book that is um, also a, a really difficult um, and complex one in many ways, but it's a book that is looking at what happens when this young boy is sort of he's marooned on this island he is brought up um by a group by by aborigines uh, um and this sort of starts this sort of wider conversation about what identity really is because suddenly we start to see this sort of shape shifting almost that um he is a character who is both seen as uh, sort of white European or sort of white Australian, um, but he is also brought up in various Aboriginal ways. And this starts to throw some um, conflict into the matter because each side feels like he, he is sort of to some degree one of them, but also not. Um, and it, it sort of exposes, particularly from the white Australian side, the sort of prejudices that are held onto in terms of um, Aboriginal characters and Aboriginal people. Um, and it starts to get a bit surreal in some ways because what that does is sort of breaks down the the notion of reality in this book and characters start to misplace or misunderstand things um, and it starts to become quite dreamlike and intangible um, and as a result ends up being an incredibly perceptive conversation about the things we do and don't understand around um, around various uh, people and, and uh, you know... It, I think it's just really quite clever. Um, it's a book that deals with this social issue, I think, in, in such a, a a big way, but it's, it's only about 200 pages and it's it's quite tight how this book really thinks through these wider narratives in such a short, sharp way. And particularly, you know, what could be very low hanging fruit to have white Australians um, saying and doing certain things, I think is dealt with a bit more nuance than that would suggest, um, where there's a, a real exploration of what that could actually look like. And actually, on a very similar note, Crossing the River by Carol Phillips is a really interesting book that explores some similar things in some ways. Um, also kind of does some quite different some quite different parts overall. So the core idea of this is really tracing diaspora across 
um, times. So we we visit, I think, three different time periods um, and we follow different black people as they move through various parts of the world. Um, and what that really starts to look like is these sort of this sort of patchwork to kind of tell bits of a history. So we have um, somebody moving from the US to uh, to I think an unnamed country in Africa, if I'm right, um, uh, on a sort of religious mission. We've got other people, uh, another time period, looking at slavery and sort of period of enslavement. And we've got um, another period of somebody, a, 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 a black American, moving to the UK um, during World War Two and how he's treated there. And in all three narratives, we sort of see how black bodies are treated in various spaces in various various parts of the world. Um, and particularly what the, the kinds of ways that history is sort of carried in a body or is carried in, in attitudes or what have you. So despite, you know, even when uh, a black soldier is in fr from the US is in the UK, um, there's still, you know, there are parts of how his his Americanness um, protects him, but and makes him exciting and new. But also how even within his own unit, he's perhaps not treated particularly well by some of the white soldiers. Um, and the sort of the, this idea, I think, particularly of this book, as the title hints at, there's a lot around this sort of uh, sort of transatlantic movement, um, and particularly kind of mirroring sort of movements of um of ships that would have carried enslaved people um it's just so interesting that how how this book sort of mirrors that and kind of looks at that journey in a complete with a completely different lens this book could very easily have just been the sort of the, the journey of the slave trade uh, but i think by kind of doing these three different time periods we get this really fascinating comparison about some of the the legacies of various aspects of this that i think was really quite perceptive and really quite um, interesting. And last but not least, we have Carol Shields with The Stone Diaries. Um, Carol Shields being our one and only woman on this shortlist. Um, yeah, <laughs> this, was, <laughs> this was the period. Um, it's, it's interesting, actually, because the early 90s, um, when you look at these shortlists, uh, there is one shortlist, 1991, with no women. Um, and a few other shortlists that have one or two women. Um, and it's quite, it's sort of quite surreal um, in some ways, because you think of just how many other incredible women writers were writing at the time um, and just somehow weren't on the list. Anyway, that that ran aside. Carol Shields with The Stone Diaries, and in some ways um, covers some similar, um, similar ground, no, similar ground, that's the phrase I'm looking for, to scar tissue, um, because some aspects of the Stone Diaries look at loss of memory. Um, and particularly, we follow a group of, um, a group of young women as they move through various decades of their lives. Um, and what we start to see is how various aspects of their lives are shaped entirely by the times that they are living in. So some parts where, um, where some of the women uh, are seen as having transgressed because they've gone against the sort of typical rules for women at the time. Um, very much inverted commas of sort of these rules for women of what's expected. Um, and whether that's around dating or sex or relationships or what have you. Um, inc including quite a funny section where um, a couple of characters are talking about what they do in France um, in terms of sex. And they're like, oh, they do these shocking things. Um, and so it's really interesting reading this in 2023 and being like, oh, wow, it's it's, <laughs> it's fun thinking of these characters being scandalised by this. Um, anyhow, uh, I think what's also really clever about this book is what's left unsaid. So we get, get closer and closer to particularly one woman's later life. Um, and we start to see at one point a set of letters that were written uh, to her that she's collected. And we don't get her mess her letters because often that is the way, right? If you're writing letters, you don't keep a copy necessarily of your own. And so a box of your letters will have these gaps in it. But what's left unsaid is so interesting because we have a couple of letters between her and some friends just keeping each other updated on life, saying, oh, look, I just got married. This is very exciting. We'd love to see you. Oh, this other big thing, life thing happened. Oh, wow, so exciting. Uh, but then we start to see this sort of slight thing creep in where there's a man who's been spurned, who is incredibly angry at her. There's somebody else who has abandoned... Um, uh, like a friend who's sort of on the verge of abandoning their friendship and is incredibly angry. There are these 
things of you know like people being very thankful that she's uh been doing all this work to um help them you know tend to their plants correctly and and so we get this kind of tapestry of a quite a complex character because she is on one hand an incredibly public figure who is beloved by some people um she is hated by others for some of the same qualities almost and so she just becomes this sort of really interesting character and as we get towards the end of the book what we really start to see is how her sense of memory um is is sort of challenged and the end part of this book i found really i I thought was really transcendent in how powerful it was um we the, the rest of the book at times can be quite chatty and quite informal or odd moments of formality or whatever you know as this sort of mixed register and it's kind of this this book that really trundles along with all this information the end passage of this book i thought was staggering in its beauty um without getting emotional but in the way that this book handles again like this scar tissue handles dementia or loss of memory um the ways that this book looks at the fear and terror that can come with being uh with, with losing memory because the sort of if you don't recognize people around you that can make you quite frazzled or quite um uh you know unnerved um or quite scared and that that manifests itself in other ways and so i i just thought the way this book builds towards an end was re- just incredible um and all the bits where i sort of struggled to understand earlier parts of the book or struggle to get into it will kind of almost have this payoff at the end of this really exceptional and incisive portrait of this woman. Um, and I've only read two of Carol Shields' books so far, um, This and Unless, uh, which is also shortlisted for the booker. And I, so far, I've just been blown away by the ways that she is able to understand characters and convey that understanding through moving a couple of sentences around or through a very specific word or a specific action that we watch them do. Um, and I really think she was incredible. Um, just from this, I really want to read a lot more of hers. So anyway, that's me rambling on for five minutes about the Stone Diaries, uh, which I just thought was a, a really interesting book in many, many ways. And that brings us neatly towards the end of the the shortlist. So those are the six books. Um, and looking back on it 30 years on and with my own lens on it of the sort of books I like, um, I'm probably also slightly biased in the sense that going through what I'm going through with my family at the moment, the Stone Diaries and Scar Tissue both directly speak to things I'm thinking about right now. And I think this is something that's interesting often with a judging panel. You know, people joked about, myself included, joked about the fact that 2023 uh, for the Booker Prize was a, a, a short list, well, a long list with a lot of dead mothers. Um, that seemed to be a pr- recurring theme where it was sort of a mother character died in the book and the whole book was often about those conversations with it or uh, about it or, or, or what have you this book there's a lot kind of going on here in terms of both memory um you know we're talking scar tissue and stone diaries of memory distinctly going but remembering babylon which looks at memory and the untrustworthiness of it crossing the river that looks at this kind of legacy thing and how we remember various people in their histories um same for under the frog and paddy clark I think they're all they all deal with memory in such fascinating ways um but I think ultimately for me uh and I don't, I don't think it's just because of the subject matter because for both books both the stone diaries and scar tissue I was really just blown away by the way that they write there's a a real clarity that allows them to cut through um difficult issues and difficult conversations particularly around something that can be so chaotic and so um, so shrouded in, in mystery um, as a sort of loss of memory. And and so I thought this was just really interesting as a shortlist. Not not my favourite shortlist overall, um, you know, you know, the few, I, I enjoyed all the books on this. There weren't that many big standout ones, but some years I'm like, yes, give me all of these books. Um, this book I thought, you know, was kind of a bit muted at times in some ways for me, but... I think overall, just some some really profound conversations and books going on here. The Stone Diaries and Scar Tissue being my two favourites, probably. I would have had either one of those win, personally. Paddy Clark was fine. It's a fine winner. It's, you know, I don't want to take away from that. Uh, My personal preferences are slightly different. Um, Anyway, uh, thank you for listening to me ramble about these books. Um, 
and for being part of the Booker project in this. I always I find this really funny. I was convinced that me doing these Booker things was so niche that nobody would ever watch them, and people seem to people seem to like them. Uh, so great. Uh, I'm glad to hear that because I really like doing them. Um, I think I've got one more before the year, one or two more before the year is out um, to kind of look at eighty eight and eighty three. Uh, but uh, thank you for for being part of this. I hope you've enjoyed this. Take care and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.